Hello, this is Bettina Arndt, and I want to talk to you today about the monstrous lies we're being fed about domestic violence. Look at this newspaper headline. It leaves no doubt about who was the villain. This story was published in Australia's Fairfax newspapers, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. It was written by a woman called Kath Mackay, who's a feminist activist, who described her poor trapped mother stuck at home caring for her five children and at the mercy of her violent husband. Inside those four walls, it was hell, she wrote. She alleged her father conspired with the neighbours to have her mother taken off to a psychiatric home. Now, soon after that article was published, I was contacted by Kath's older sisters, Barbara and Margaret, and they wrote to me objecting to the way the, their father had been portrayed in this article, portrayed as a violent man, while whitewashing her mother's violent history. Here's a photo of the family. The parents are in the, in the back row with Margaret and Barbara with Kath, who's the youngest, are in the bottom row. At the time the psychiatric hospital incident happened, Kath was a baby and the two older women were up to eight years older than her. The two older sisters were old enough to witness the mother's attacks on their father. They'd seen their father's knocked to the ground when the mother threw a heavy crystal object at his head. And Kath herself got a black eye from the mother, which was clearly visible in one of the early school photos. Here's Barbara talking about that time. She says, I remember in my teenage years receiving blood noses from mum when she off the, went off the planet about something. She always seemed to aim for my head. Their whole neighbourhood was afraid of that mother. She was known for barging into their homes and attacking them verbally and physically. She sometimes left them black and blue, said Margaret. The neighbours often had to call the police to protect themselves. And ultimately, the, the neighbours actually got together and put together a petition to seek psychiatric help from, for the mother, Marion. And although Kath claims in her article that it was the father who conspired with the neighbours to have the mother committed, Margaret remembers when this happened, her father had tears in his eyes. He felt betrayed by the neighbours. I thought they were my friends, he told her. So he was really upset that this happened. It wasn't the father's fault. The two older sisters are really shocked at their sister's effort to present their family history as a vicious man terrorising their family. They only ever witnessed their, their father actually trying to restrain the mother during her rages. Kath's article makes no mention of her mother's violent history, except to suggest that she fought back when her father, the father, was attacking her. The two older women are now speaking out because they know that all, although men's violence, of course, is a very serious issue, there are many people like them who grew up tiptoeing around a dangerous mother. Here's Margaret talking. She says, it's not just that my sister was trying to misrepresent what happened to our family. Our whole society seems determined to pretend that violent mothers don't exist, but they do. There are plenty of children who, like us, grew up in families where they watched their mothers attack their fathers, families where everyone was frightened of the mother's rages. Why is everyone in Australia trying to pretend the whole problem is about dangerous men? That's only part of the story, she says. So we, here we have this cooked up story which happens to fit the domestic violence narrative promoted by these Fairfax new, newspapers that men are the sole perpetrators of domestic violence. So it's hardly surprising that no one on those papers bothered, bothered to check Kath's story, even though there are neighbours still around who can verify that the whole neighbourhood was frightened of this woman. This is only one tiny example of the constant distorted propaganda we face every day about what's happening in family violence. Listen to our Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull. The single most important thing each and every one of us can do as parents, especially as fathers and as mothers, is to make sure that our sons respect their mothers and their sisters. No, Malcolm, you've been sold a pup. There's no good evidence of misogynist attitudes towards women are the cause of domestic violence in Western countries like Australia. You have chosen to waste hundreds of millions of dollars on a misguided, useless approach to this important social issue. No doubt you've been told that this is going to win you lots of women's votes, but there are plenty of women who see through this facile nonsense, just as there are good men around the country you're choosing to insult and malign. 
It is outrageous that so many of our key government or institutions are promoting misinformation about this important issue. There's a constant stream of half-truths, deliberate twisting of statistical information that paints the picture of men as the only villains and denies women's role in domestic violence. Here's the ABC, our public broadcaster, announcing a study published about girls witnessing their father's, father's violence. The research they were talking about is from the Australian Institute of Criminology's Young People and Domestic Violence Study. Somehow the ABC failed to mention that while 23% of young people were aware of domestic violence against their mothers or stepmothers, an almost identical proportion, 22%, of this, these young people were aware of violence against their fathers or stepfathers by their mothers or stepmothers, as shown in the same study. That's a very convenient omission by our public broadcaster, which was renowned for promoting misinformation about domestic violence. Yet the sort of deliberate omission that I've been talking about is everywhere. We see the bureaucracies constantly downplaying statistics which demonstrate the role of women in family violence and beating up evidence of male aggression. There are many thousands of peer-reviewed studies that reveal this more complex picture. Most family violence is actually two-way violence involving women as well as men. Children in violent homes rarely learn about violence from watching their fathers. Most are actually being exposed to both parents having a go at each other. Yet we never hear about that in the relentless misinformation, whitewashing women's role in family violence. What's extraordinary about this is we're not listening to children. Just think about when we first learnt about sexual abuse and how many children were being abused by parents, by other adults. And to our shame, we realised that so many abused children had not been heard when they tried to speak out about what was happening to them. Now our society is doing exactly the same thing. We only want to hear from children about when they talk about daddy's violence and we just don't want to know when mummy's the one who's putting children at risk. How scary it must be for these kids when they're afraid of their mothers and yet the whole society is telling them that this never happens. I want to tell you about a man who knows exactly what that's like. See this little boy in the first photo? You can see a mark on his nose. In the second photo, it's even more obvious. He has a very visible broken nose, which caused him to be endlessly teased and bullied when he was growing up, because everyone thought he looked a little bit weird. Now, he's only learnt fairly recently by his father that he'd been told that he'd fallen down a slippery slide, but his father now tells him it was his violent mother who had thrown him to the ground because he was crying. He's now a 53-year-old man who's still haunted by memories of his violent mother, his really frightening mother. And he grew up and became a policeman where he had to go into homes and, of course, he had to deal with many violent men, but he also saw lots of households where the women were violent too. He wrote to me last year because he now works in a government department and he was really outraged because he was required to attend a, a white ribbon workplace seminar where they were lectured to about men's violence and he heard not a single word about the dangers of violent women. In my talk at the International Men's Conference a few weeks ago, I mentioned the ABC program Australian Story, which features Fiona Richardson, who's the Victorian Minister for, for the Prevention of Family Violence. This was such an amazing example of this web of lies that's constantly being promoted about domestic violence that I couldn't resist showing you some of this now. So the program features this government minister talking about her own family history. And the bulk of the program, of course, fo focuses on Fiona's father, who she describes as having a lot of charm, oodles of charm, but when he was drunk, he was a very different man. Funny that because her own government, of course, downplays the link between alcohol and domestic violence. They're so determined to present domestic violence as all about misogynist attitudes, all about men's attitudes to women. And they refuse to acknowledge that alcohol or drug abuse or any of these other factors have, has anything to do with the problem. But the main theme of this Australian Story program was the damage done by violent men like Fiona's dad. Here's her brother Alistair talking about her father's rages. And that's when he, um, he hit me. Um, and I remember the first, 
first punch, which was to the face, um, and I can't recall anything from there. And there's nothing I can do. What can I do? I'm this big. Nothing I can do. What did you think of your father at that moment? I couldn't stand him. I hated him. With a passion. But there was one tiny section of this program which revealed a very much more complex story. There were two tiny quotes which revealed that Fiona's grandmother was a vicious woman. Here's Fiona's mother, Veronica Power, describing her background. I tried to understand why I had put up with being beaten by my husband for so many years. And then I sort of, I sort of said to myself, well, it's because your mother was violent. I thought being beaten was normal because my mother always beat me. Now, even more astonishing was Veronica mentioned in past, just simply in passing, that her mother had set her up to be groomed by one of the grandmother, the mother's own boyfriends, who took Veronica's virginity when she was 14. Richie was very um, kind to me and he took a great interest in me and I was allowed to spend time with him and I wasn't allowed to spend time with anybody else. He started to, to groom me and ultimately he took my virginity. How old were you at that stage? 14. How extraordinary that the ABC producers shamelessly ignored this horrible piece of family history while building up their whole program as an attack on Fiona's father. How come no one else in the media commented on their distorted reporting? It's amazing that this government minister has the effrontery in these circumstances to ignore her own history and stand up in front of us promoting her state's endless male bashing domestic violence policies. There's no doubt trawling through the past is very challenging for me and also incredibly sad. But it has given me this unique insight into victims of family violence, particularly childhood victims of family violence who are so often lost in our response uh, to, to family violence. No matter what the Royal Commission uh, determines, we're going to do a range of things, including a first for Australia. We're going to have uh, a Family Violence uh, Victims Advisory Council because ultimately we know that is the only way we're going to keep uh, politicians, judges, police, all of us, in fact, honest. Honest, Fiona Richardson? If you were honest, you acknowledge that both men and women can do terrible things, as you well know. So why are you leaving out half of the story? Of course, if you do tell the story, you'll come in for attack, as happened to Erin Pizzi. I'm sure many of you know this amazing woman's story. She started the first women's refuge in Britain, but she got in trouble with the feminists because she started to speak out about how many women in her refuge were actually violent, dangerous to their children and violent to others around them, women, other women in the refuge. As Erin has said, I always knew that women can be as vicious and ir irresponsible as men. She describes her experiences with her mother, who used to attack her with a cord from an iron. She didn't actually want girls, she only wanted one boy. And unfortunately she got twin girls. My sister was safe because she looked like my mother, but I looked like my father. And that was enough for her, to really, to make me an outcast. From the, I think it was about four and a half when I realised she didn't even like me, she didn't even like to look at me. And from the very early age, she used to tell me I was born to be hanged. And she beat me very badly. See here photos of Erin Pizzi outside her, her refuge for women and the demonstrations that were actually held attacking her stance on domestic violence. She received so much criticism for the fact she was telling the truth about domestic violence. She received death threats, constant attacks from the feminists and was eventually forced to leave her native England um, after her dog had been killed. From the Australian perspective, there's a really fascinating story about Erin Pizzi. And this was back in the 1970s. And she was invited to Australia to see our newly established women's refuges. But on the way, she went to New Zealand to see what they were doing there. And she started to speak out about her changing views, about the fact that she was realising that a lot of women were violent too and that domestic violence was not a gender issue. Um, unfortunately, the news travelled 
uh, reports came through to the refugees in Australia that that's what Pizzi was saying and they decided not to invite her. Her visit to Australia was cancelled. That was in 1976 and since then the gendered view of domestic violence has had an incredible grip not only on Australian society but in Britain, America and many other Western countries. And the real complexities of this important issue are totally ignored. There's an enormous amount of research, 40 years of research, revealing those complexities. Researchers found, for instance, as they went out and asked men and women not whether they were victims of violence, but whether they're actually perpetrators, they got a very different story. Now, here's Terry Moffat. She's now at Duke University, but in the 1990s, she was working in New Zealand as a researcher on the world-renowned Dunedin Longitudinal Study. It found that women hit men just as often as men hit women. We ask questions like, you know, have you hit your partner? Have you thrown your partner across the room? Have you used a knife on your partner? And I thought, we're wasting our time asking these questions of the girls. But they said yes to them. And they said yes to them in the same numbers that the boys did. I've done it. I'll spaz out and just do something mental and try and stab them and throw, throw things up or smash the house up. This research was being done by one of the world leaders in social science research. Dunedin is really well known for meticulous data. And yet when these researchers looked at domestic violence, no one wanted to hear what was going on. When this finding first came out, it was flat rejected by most feminist criminologists. So we really had difficulty getting those papers published. Uh, uh, even after the papers were published, uh, we were never invited to present the findings at any conferences. Uh, it was one of the most difficult parts of the research to, to get it out there. Last year, I tried to talk to these researchers when I was doing, writing about domestic violence and they refused to take my, call, my calls. They've had such a hard time since their domestic violence research was published. They refuse to even discuss their findings any longer. And the same applies to academics and researchers across the world. People are far too nervous to speak out about what is going on here. They're worried about losing uh, their positions in universities. They're worried about their funding. And they know if they do speak out, they'll get ripped apart. We have this huge domestic violence industry which is fighting fiercely against any attempt to tell the whole story about this complex social issue. Their massive propaganda bureaucracy churns out endless lies and distortions about the statistics. Politicians compete with each other to promise more funding and the whole juggernaut just rolls on. But I'm determined to do what I can to derail it. I'm gonna be making a whole series of vlogs about all of this, talking to some of the brave experts who know what's going on. I have some amazing people who are doing terrific research in this area and I look forward to giving you the chance to hear what they're doing and what they have to say about this whole issue. But if we're going to change this situation for children growing up in these homes, we absolutely have to start by telling the truth.